Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this particular lecture serves several functions. It was originally prepared for our junior class called ECE Design Fundamentals at Georgia Tech, and it can also serve as a resource for our capstone design courses. And I'm also using it for my guitar amplification and effects class. There are some things we should talk about there. These slides were originally prepared by my colleague Steve Kinney, who I taught the junior design class with, and I added a few tidbits. Electricity is dangerous. In addition to shocking you, it can potentially set things on fire, and it might then set you on fire. It's fairly rare, but it can happen. And beyond just keeping you safe, it's a whole lot cheaper to replace a fuse than an entire circuit board assembly. Nowadays, so much stuff is built using tiny surface mount parts that people usually just throw away an entire circuit board and replace it rather than trying to fix the components on the board. One thing I like about a lot of this old style tube equipment is that it's something that you can still readily repair. And it's not necessarily always the case that you're worried about a lightning strike destroying your equipment instantaneously. You can have situations where something might be slightly out of spec and the equipment will continue to work, but it will do damage to it long term. This can be an issue with old Commodore 64 power supplies. In addition to the issue of parts failing, there are many opportunities for user error. I think one of the most dangerous things in the universe is this standard 2.1 millimeter barrel jack that people use for DC power. Not only is there not a standard for what the voltage should be, so people will take a 12 volt supply and plug it into something that wants 5 volts and blow it up. I think I might have actually done that to one of my MIDI keyboards. Anyway, there's no standard about what the polarity of the power supply is. Most devices nowadays have a positive tip convention. There are some older devices, like some older game consoles I've seen that use a negative tip convention. But nowadays there is a place where negative tip conventions are used a whole lot, and that is in guitar effects pedals. To understand why guitar pedals tend to use this negative tip convention, we have to talk a little bit about how they are traditionally wired. This drawing by Stuart Morrow is from this excellent DIY Strat blog. So first of all, let's take a look at the input jack for the signal. So this is coming from your electric guitar. The signal is here, but they actually use a stereo jack. So this is the tip of a quarter inch connector, this is the ring of a quarter inch connector, and this is the sleeve. So the way this winds up working is that you want to make sure that the battery is disconnected when you're not using the pedal. So when you plug in your guitar, then basically the ring and the sleeve are shorted, and then the negative part of the battery is then hooked to the ground. But if you unplug your guitar, the negative part of the battery isn't connected to that ground anymore, so it takes it out of the circuit. So that way you don't have to have a separate on-off switch that you would forget to turn off. All right, now let's talk about the input jack. So this is the tip of the DC jack, and this is the ring. And this schematic notation here indicates that if you don't plug anything in, there's a connection that's internally made that connects the positive of the battery to the bits of your circuitry that want power. But when you plug something into the jack, this default connection that's called a normal connection is disconnected, and then you're getting your power from the outside world. Notice then that when you're using an external supply, the battery is disconnected, so you're not trying to power something from a battery and an external source at the same time, which is a bad idea, especially if that battery and the external power source are at slightly or not so slightly different voltages. So when you're using one of these pedals, you need to use a 9-volt negative tip supply. Of course, the danger is there are a whole lot of 9-volt positive tip supplies out there. 
So companies like Roland that make the Boss brand of pedals put in some kind of reverse voltage protection at their power inputs. Taking a look at the DS1 distortion pedal, we see that there's this diode D1. So under normal operating conditions, you have nine volts here and you have zero volts down here and this diode is reverse biased, so it's not in play. But if you were to get your voltages reversed, then this diode will conduct and the rest of the circuit is saved, at least for a little while. This circuit actually bothers me a lot. Imagine putting nine volts across this diode. Now, this isn't a wimpy one in four, one four eight kind of diode. They use a one in four zero zero four power diode in this spot. So it's reasonably beefy. But I looked through a bunch of data sheets and I can't find any information as to how this is expected to react when you're putting that much voltage across it. And the only resistance to limit the current is whatever the internal resistance of your nine volt battery is. It looks to me like this thing would start to get hot. And as it gets hot, maybe it fails. And if this winds up failing as a short, well, now you've shorted out your battery and your battery is going to get even hotter. Or maybe it fails as an open circuit, in which case your protection is now gone and the rest of the circuit fries. Anyway, if you can convince me that this is a good scheme, please leave a comment below. Let's have a discussion because the circuit bothers me a lot and I would like to feel more at peace with it. Oh, and I was just now thinking about the battery. If you plug a really beefy power supply into this AC adapter that can provide a lot of current, wow, this is really unsettling. Well, I guess it's better than nothing. Instead of putting the diode in parallel with your supply, you can actually put your diode in series with the supply to provide some reverse polarity protection. The problem with this, of course, is that you now have the diode drop to deal with. So that might be 0.7 volts, something like that for a regular silicon diode. You can use a Schottky diode that has something more like a 0.3 volt drop. But in either case, you also have the issue that the exact voltage drop depends on the current. So as the current needed by your load changes, that voltage also changes. So you might want some additional regulation. There's more sophisticated schemes out there that deal with these issues. They tend to use MOSFETs as switches. Shown on the right here is a giant modular synthesizer. This particular one was constructed by Ray Wilson, who is a giant on the do-it-yourself synthesizer scene. He ran a company called Music from Outer Space. His website is still up, and I would invite you to explore it and learn about Ray's designs. Ray sadly passed away some years ago. Modular synthesizers like this consist of individual components of oscillators and filters and wave shapers and amplifiers that can be controlled by voltages created by control voltage sources of various sorts. And you hook these modules together with patch cables. And one nice thing about this is that it's sort of a quasi standard where modules by a bunch of different manufacturers can be hooked together. But there are potential dangers there. You might have a patch cord that's dangling where the tip of the patch cord hits something that's grounded, or somebody might try to hook two outputs together. So here's a bit of the circuitry from Ray's voltage-controlled oscillator, at least one of the versions of it. This is the triangle wave output. And notice that Ray is not taking the output of an op amp and putting it directly to an output jack. He has a 1K resistor here for protection. This way, if somebody accidentally takes the output and shorts it to ground, the op amp has some resistance here, so there's a reasonable current flowing through this resistor, and the op amp isn't suddenly presented with just whatever the resistance of the wire is going to ground. That will force the op amp to try to create too much current, which leads to bad things. Okay, so let's see what amount of power is dissipated across this resistor in something like a worst case scenario. So the circuit is designed to be able to run off of plus minus 12 volts or plus minus 15 volts, depending on how you set certain component values. 
and the TLO 74 op amp can't go all the way to the power supply rails at its output, it can get probably within about a volt. So let's say that the op amp was wanting to produce 14 volts and the output was shorted to ground. Now, it's very unlikely that any of the circuits in Ray's catalog are actually going to be in a situation where it's going to try to put the full possible voltage out of an op amp and try to hold it there. So this is really a worse than worst case scenario, but let's try it. Let's see, so 14 volts squared will give me 196, and I divide that by 1K. Well, okay, I could really just interpret this as milliwatts. So that's 196 milliwatts, that's less than 250 milliwatts, so it's within a quarter watt. So, in the next lecture, we'll look at the Humble Fuse and its various friends. And in the lecture after that, we'll look at grounding and isolation.